Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Welcome to Family Talk with your host, psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. James Dobson. He's the voice you trust for the family you love. I'm Roger Marsh, and today we have a real treat for you. Dr. Del Tackett will be joining Dr. Dobson once again to continue their conversation about Dr. Tackett's 2017 film called Is Genesis History? As you'll hear in today's interview, Is Genesis History is more than a documentary film. And by the way, if you haven't done so already, you should stream it. Just search for Is Genesis History Film. This thought-provoking movie can be the first step on a journey toward understanding the history of the earth according to the book of Genesis for you and your family to enjoy. In this project, Dr. Tackett travels across the continent with over a dozen scientists and scholars investigating fascinating evidence for the creation and the flood. Now, before we go to today's exciting interview, let me introduce Dr. Dobson's respected guest. Dr. Del Tackett is the creator of the worldview curriculum called The Truth Project. Previously, he served more than 20 years as an officer in the United States Air Force. He holds three earned degrees, a Bachelor of Science from Kansas State University, a Master of Science from Auburn University, and he earned his doctorate in management from Colorado Technical University. Dr. Tackett is also the creator of The Engagement Project, which is his most recent worldview curriculum for small groups. Dr. Tackett and his wife, Melissa, have four grown children, and they make their home in Colorado. Well, with no further ado, here now once again is Dr. James Dobson with his special guest, Dr. Del Tackett, as they continue their classic conversation right here on Family Talk. So the question is, is Genesis history? Mm. At the end of the program last time, uh, we were about to talk about the flood Noah yes. and the flood. Mm-hmm. And uh, really to the rational mind, that seems impossible. One man building an ark. How many years? 100 years? 130 well, years? Could be 100, maybe 120. <laughs> that that he worked on it and mm-hmm. getting uh, the, all the species involved in into the ark and feeding them for that. The whole thing seems mm-hmm. a little spooky. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that disrespectfully, sure, right. but we know that the Bible is true. If it mm-hmm. says it, I believe it. That's the end of it. Mm. Uh, explain why the flood is so important in the understanding. Well, it's critical uh, just in the same way we were talking last time about how Paul is referring to the one man, Adam. Uh, I would start with what Peter refers to when he says that there will be scoffers that will come and they will say, where's the promise of his coming? And then Peter then lays out the argument where he says, it is, escapes their notice. And in the Greek, it implies that they willfully unnotice. They willfully unnotice that God destroyed the world with water. And therefore, then Peter says, because they unnotice that, because they deny that, I call it putting a tarp over the evidence yeah. that God destroyed the world with a flood. They therefore miss, as Peter is putting it together, says that God is going to destroy it with fire in the future. And this, to me, is very, very critical and why the flood is critical, because if you deny that, then you'll have a tendency to deny that God is going to bring judgment again, and he's going to bring judgment with fire. So this whole notion about the Noahic flood is not just some pretty little story back there that you can believe or you can not believe. It's no big deal. Peter, I think, puts it right in the midst of one's understanding of the judgment of God and that he will judge again. What do the scientists say? Uh, The skeptics especially. Well, uh, if you look first at the skeptics, uh, they mentioned some things that you were were pointing to in the beginning, Uh, that uh, to have a global flood uh, with an ark that's got all the animals on it and all that kind of stuff, it sounds fanciful. And so most people have then at least said, well, what we're dealing with here is a local flood. Uh, if they accept any kind of a flood at all. There are some who say, well, it's all myth. But the scientists that we will be dealing with in the film in the, is Genesis history. 
uh, we're going to be looking at the geological evidence, for example, that I think points to the fact that the evidence of that global flood is everywhere. It's all over the world in these massive sedimentary layers uh, that I think you can only explain through this worldwide catastrophe in which the world that was, that's what Peter calls it, the world that was, that's how drastic this was. Mm. I think we do a disservice for our children when we have these little uh, children's books uh, and we sing the song, you know, the rain came down and the floods came up uh, as if the world just got soaked. Well, that's not what the scripture says. The fountains of the deep broke open. Uh, This could well have not only involved some underground uh, reservoirs, but most likely involved the breaking open of magma as the crust broke open. And we're now dealing with a global catastrophe beyond which I think we cannot even fathom it. But it was a catastrophe that uh, ground the crust of the earth up And then in this tsunami beyond belief, deposited those sedimentary layers, burying uh, the creatures in those sedimentary layers from which we get the fossils. So anyway, I I get carried away because I love this. And I know you do Mm because you have a scientific mind as well. Uh, I enjoyed meeting with these scientists in the field. We went down into the Grand Canyon. We looked at the layers. We looked at the nautiloid fossils. um, And those were the things that we're trying to lay before people Uh, to say, look, there's evidence here that what God told us really happened. Uh, Most creation uh, geologists, creation scientists, uh, would agree that when God destroyed the earth with a flood, uh, that is when we got this huge um, tectonic plate movement. And that's when we get the rise of these huge mountains. But even so, there's enough volume of water. I figured this out by myself one time. I figured the volume of water that is on the earth right now, you know, the world is mostly covered with water. The volume of water that we have right now, if the world were a cue ball, that water would be, if I've got my figures, I remember, anyway, it's like 5,000 feet, almost a mile deep. So most people don't realize just how much water there is right now on on the earth. Uh, I think there is plenty uh, enough water to cover the mountains at that time. Hmm. And the fossils are the residue of that catastrophic event. Yes, that's what uh, I believe. That's what these paleontologists and the other people that uh, we interview in the film, we look at those fossils Uh, We looked at the soft dinosaur tissue uh, in a lab in Arizona. It was fascinating to me. I I got a chance to hold it, to look at it. Um, Their perspective is that when God destroyed the world, he also said he was going to destroy all life with breath in it. And that is why uh, he had to save uh, Noah and his children and uh, the various kinds that would repopulate the world. And most people don't realize that or understand that. You didn't need to have all the wolves and foxes and dogs. You only needed the dog kind, one pair of dog kind, because they carry the genetics for all of those creatures. But God destroyed even the animal life in that flood. And that's what we find. In reality, the sedimentary layers all over the world are a mass graveyard filled with uh, fossils of all of these creatures that were destroyed uh, in that flood. And quite frankly, it's the only way you can really come up with fossils. I mean, because, I mean, I grew up on a farm. (laughs) You know, if if a rabbit dies and falls on the ground, you know, it's not going to fossilize. You know, it's going to be preyed Uh on and rot. And uh, so you have to have special conditions for that. And we believe that was the flood. Was this a risky project? for you to enter into. Are you going to pay a price for saying these things? Are you not going to be seen as one of those creationist crazies (laughs) that, uh, and I'm referring not to the way I characterize them, um, but uh, what's that mean for you personally? Well, it's a very important uh, question and comment because I had a number of people caution me uh, before I did the film when they heard that I was going to do it. They cautioned me because they didn't want me uh, to be then lumped in with all of these unscientific, uh, stupid, ignorant creation wackos. 
Um, but I guess, quite frankly, I am one. Uh, I don't think I'm a wacko. Uh, and I do think that sometimes the rhetoric has not been Christ-like on both sides. Uh, often people who hold to a young earth, near time, as I call it, have had a tendency to point to Christians who hold to an old earth and say you're unbiblical. And oftentimes people who hold to the old earth point to the young earth people and say you're idiots, <laughs> you're stupid uh, and unscientific. Uh, but I, I believe the issues are so great, uh, especially as what we've been talking about. We're talking about losing Adam. We're talking about losing the concept of original sin. We're talking about losing the, the promise of the gospel in the garden. We're, we're talking about losing uh, the reality of a God who judges, a holy God who judges sin in a horrific way, and he will do it again. Uh, we're in danger of wiping all of that out when we, when we say, oh, Genesis is just metaphor. It's just simile. It's just poetry. Um, and it was so important to me that I'm willing to be called crazy. Yeah. And you know what, Dr. Dobson, you've been called crazy, and you have not uh, been have willing been. to walk away from what God has called you to hold true to the Scripture. And I'm following your footsteps here. Mm-hmm. I, I, it is so important to me to hold true uh, to the Word of God that I, quite frankly, don't care You know, if, if people think I'm a little loony. It's an honor to carry the banner. It's an honor to stand up for what you believe. Mm. And if people don't agree with you, then live it, give it to the Lord, yeah. uh, because this comes out of His Word. I believe in His Word. I believe in the validity of it and uh, the applicability to my life and the lives of those I love. Uh, but if you begin to tamper with it, you don't know where to stop. Right. I mean, look at the uh, foundation for marriage, which is mm. found right mm-hmm. in Genesis 2. Yes. And where the, we read the words, uh, that for this cause a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one yes. flesh. Mm-hmm. Is that gone too? It, did marriage start there or did it evolve or did that come from the Creator Himself? Yeah. And if you say it did not come from God, what do you do uh, with the metaphor between Christ and the church, yes. which is marriage? I mean, it's all linked together. It, it's all linked together, and it's all linked together because of the exquisite truth of God. And I mean, you've been fighting, Dr. Dobson, you know, practically your whole life for the family. And yet it's rooted there. We live in a culture today that doesn't want it to be rooted in anything. We live in a culture that even wants to do away with the notion of male and female. And it, That's breathtaking. It, it is breathtaking, but you know that's happening. And so this is the criticality of looking at the Word of God and believing that historically it is correct and that God is the one who created male. He's the one who created female. He's the one who brought the male and the female together. And he was the one who said, now you go be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And it brought a blessing with it. But when you deny that, and we, you know what? We have a tendency to deny the Scripture whenever it bumps into yeah. to our own desire. And, uh, but that doesn't lead to good things. And you know that, and I know that as well. All we do is look across our nation and see what happens when we walk away from the absolute truth of God's Word. And that's where we're going, because there is no other truth. There is this no. is the truth project. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Well, that's why we did that as well. And, and that's my, my desire. I know that's your desire as well. I, just, I pray every Tuesday I'm on my knees praying uh, for that one thing, that, that God would bring repentance to this nation, that he would bring us to our knees in repentance, uh, that we would turn again and gaze upon the face of the God who has blessed us so deeply for so many years. The only aspect of all this that we're talking about uh, that I think I have to acknowledge mm. is that God is sovereign, and we can't even mm. begin to grasp who he is and how he did all the things that he did. And I Certainly. mentioned to you at our lunch mm-hmm. together that we see through a glass darkly. We don't know it all, 
and we won't know it until we get to the other side, and then we will know even as we are known. Mm. Uh, but there are aspects of what took place there in Genesis that we don't comprehend and can't explain. You know, that, and that's really so true. So what I'm arguing for is not to simplify the Genesis, mm-hmm. uh, to recognize mm-hmm. its validity, but also recognize that there are aspects to it that haven't been revealed to us. And you know what? I agree with that because we are looking at a miracle, I mean, for those who hold to the historical reading of Genesis, that God is the one who spoke and everything came into being. And then there is that, one of the great understatements of the scripture, and he made the stars also. He is the one. He is the God who is so omnipotent. He is so powerful. He is so mighty that he can speak. Jesus uh, was the one who took the water at, at the wedding at Cana. And he, he turned that instantly into wine. And if you'd been the little winemaker, you know, standing there, yeah. you would have looked at it and said, well, I can do that, but you give me 30 years <laughs> to do that. Uh, and yet we're faced with a miracle that cannot be uh, understood and cannot be examined physically. I don't think you could have examined the wine that Jesus made at the wedding and come up through naturalistic scientific processes to determine that Jesus yeah. had turned that water into wine. You start trying to to explain them away, and it, you look foolish. You, you surely do. And none of I don't think any of us can really sit down and come up with a physical, natural way that Jesus rose from the dead. It was a miracle. <laughs> God performed that miracle. And and I think what we see in the first part of the passage in Genesis is the miraculous hand of God, the Word of God, at work. And certainly there is a limit to our ability through natural means to be able to try and understand that. Uh, you know, there is so much scientific truth in the Bible, and we gloss over it. We don't even read it. We don't understand mm. it when we do read it. For example, in Isaiah it says, He sitteth above the orb of the earth. How did Columbus, if he did, (laughs) and others before him see the world as flat? You find out right there that it's an orb. Mm -hmm. We're a sphere. And it's right in front of us, but Mm -hmm. we miss it. Yeah, we miss it because we we haven't gotten the ability to see as much. Now we you know we see it from the moon, and still uh, don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people don't uh, believe it as well. But you know that brings up a great point because some of the things we deal with in this film, uh, we're dealing with uh, microbiologists, and we're looking at the amazing things these little machines that we're finding now within uh, the living cell. In fact, I was, I was just uh, with one uh, uh, scientist. We were uh, filming him at uh, Lipscomb University. He's working in cancer research. And there are these little tiny uh, machines that we now know exist uh, that do an, a remarkable work. Dr. Crick, when they discovered DNA, you know, DNA has that coiled yes. uh, feature to it. And he knew that that had to be unwound in order for the cell to replicate. And he knew that that would cause problems because it would super coil. You know, just if you had a rope, two ropes yeah. and coiled and you pull it apart, it's like your telephone cord. And he knew that something had to compensate for this. He just didn't know what it was. Well, now we know it's these these little machines, uh, these uh, topoisomeris machines that come out of nowhere when the cell's ready to replicate, and they attach to the DNA at the right place. They clip the DNA, unwind it, the replication occurs, and after it's over, it winds it back up and melds the thing together, and then the little machine goes off somewhere else. I mean, how in the world can anyone look at that and not be in awe at the exquisite complexity of the little tiny things in the, in the middle of a living cell, and how can anyone think that that all occurred as a result of random processes? You know, Adele, uh, I was sitting in a physician's office not too long ago. I had a problem with my foot. And uh, he stepped out of uh, the room for a minute, the examining room, 
and I picked up a plastic model of the uh, skeletal structure mm. of the leg and foot, and I just stood there marveling. <laughs> At, I mean, I wish I could say right now how many separate bones mm. there are in the foot. Many people listening to us will know. But how did they all get there? They're all the right size. They fit, and they hold up a 200-pound man. And I just sat there and said, you know, this physician who spent his life mm. studying the bones of the body and, and even the foot, what I'm looking at here— don't see the wisdom of the design yes, right. that was put into every cell, every dimension of the yes. human body. It's just, it's yeah. foolishness. The great passage in, in Job that says, but ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds of the air and they will tell you, or the fish of the sea. Uh, and then it says, which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And that's the remarkable thing that God has given us the ability to do now in the scientific capabilities that we have to be able to look uh, into the little cell, for example, and to see these amazing things. It's The psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and that's true. But now you can say the little machine Machines declare yeah. the glory of God as well. Well, Adele, we're almost out of time. Let's talk about your film. Well, uh, there's going to be some uh, teaching that will be uh, uh, training and teaching elements that will be developed to help people uh, if they want to dive down deeper uh, into any one of these areas. So we'll give links uh, to these scientists and some of their articles and research papers. Uh, so that'll let people go as deep as they want to. The film is going to show what? It's going to show basically me meeting with scientists, at Mount St. Helens, uh, scuba diving at St. Thomas, uh, walking down into the Grand Canyon at the zoo, a dinosaur dig in Hanson Ranch in Wyoming, uh, traveling all over, meeting with these scientists, uh, incredibly smart scientists, and looking at that evidence in the field uh, that we believe supports the fact that Genesis is history. Well, we're proud of you, and well, I thank, thank you, God Dr. for you. Uh, you love the Lord. I see it in your eyes. I see it in everything that you do, Dill. And I, I thank you for your friendship to me and for uh, the years that we worked mm. together. And, uh, and now it's fun watching what God's yeah. doing with you. Well, Dr. Dobson, I have to reply to that because, uh, you know, I have, I have enjoyed my time working with you. You have been an inspiration uh, not only to me but to millions of people all over the world, and I thank you for that. God be with you in the days ahead. Thank you, sir. God bless. Well, that was a touching conclusion to Dr. Dobson's two-part classic interview with Dr. Del Tackett. For the past couple of days here on Family Talk, these colleagues and friends have been discussing Dr. Tackett's 2017 documentary film called Is Genesis History? If your curiosity was piqued and you'd like to check out Dell's film, remember you can find information on how to watch it when you visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Family Talk. And Dell is actually in the fundraising stage of production for the sequel to Is Genesis History. Again, you can learn about that project as well as Dell's many other ministry endeavors when you visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Or if you'd prefer, feel free to give us a call at 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. And as a reminder, Dr. Tackett has been partnering with our team here at the JDFI to create short, valuable videos that we're calling Worldview Moments. In these videos, Dr. Tackett addresses relevant, important worldview topics in an accessible and easy-to-understand format. To watch these Worldview Moments, please visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Dell Tackett. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash D-E-L. T-A-C-K-E-T-T. -T -T. You will not be disappointed. For the entire month of July here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, we've been partnering with best-selling author Shanti Feldhahn to provide Shanti's popular 30-Day Kindness Challenge to our listeners. For 30 days, participants will practice real, tangible kindness toward one person who they want to improve their relationship with, and they'll be guided every step of the way. 
Now, just because we're nearing the end of the month does not mean that it's too late to join. You can actually start any time. So sign up for the free 30-day kindness challenge today by visiting drjamesdobson.org forward slash kindness challenge. When you sign up, you'll receive an email with all the details about the challenge. And then for the next 30 days in a row, you'll get daily emails with tips and advice for how you can become more kind. Sign up now at drjamesdobson.org forward slash kindness challenge. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for keeping Family Talk in your prayers. Remember, without your constant support, we would not have the privilege of standing up for righteousness and encouraging families in the culture. I'm Roger Marsh, and from all of us here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, may the Lord continue to richly bless you and your family as you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.